Hello everyone and welcome to a little terminal rendering aside. Normally this is Handmade Hero, but uh, because last weekend was a heat wave, I had promised to do some terminal demo stuff and I did, but it was silent and in the middle of the night and only about five or 10 minutes or something. Uh, so I'm gonna do the actual terminal demonstration with talking uh, today. And uh, just to give people some background about this, there was, for reasons that are totally not worth going into, a lot of the standard sort of uh, nonsense developer excuse factory stuff going on with regards to monospace text rendering. And uh, generally speaking, one of the problems that we have that's endemic in development today is that instead of people just acknowledging the fact that pretty much 100% of software is like either 100 or 1000 times slower than it should be. Uh, they just make all these excuses as to why that is correct. Um, there are so many that I don't even know what they all are off the top of my head, but you know, they range anywhere from ones that are actually, they're not, they're not really excuses. They're, they're, they're potentially even reasonable explanations like, you know, we don't care about that. We just want fast time to market. Like, we know we're shipping bad quality software. We just, that's not our goal, right? And that's pretty reasonable as an excuse because that meant, you know, you're acknowledging the fact that the software is bad, but you're overtly saying, look, we're not, we don't care, right? And there's, uh, there's a lot to that, right? Like, doing a bad job on something, but acknowledging that and is, is, a, is big, right? Because then at least it's intentional. Um, but most of the other excuses you hear are, are actually not even really excuses. They're, they're kind of factually incorrect. They're like, well, you know, if, if it was going to, if it, if it wasn't 1000 times slower, it would be too hard to maintain or something, which is, I, I mean, it's crazy because I've seen the code bases where people say that. And actually the fast version would have been much easier to maintain because it would have been a lot less code, but you know, whatever there's like, oh, this problem is really hard. That's why it's so slow. It, it, it's almost never actually the case. You know, there are hard problems that computers do struggle with the, it's almost never what it is. So there's just all these excuses. And this was another case where there was just a lot of excuse making as for why um, terminal rendering was slow. Now, terminal rendering is a problem that's been around uh, for, you know, more than half a century at this point, I would wager. I don't know when the first terminal display uh, came into being, but terminal displays have been with us since the very beginning, really. Um, and in a sense, a terminal is really just an extension of a line printer. Like, you know, the very earliest computers just printed out uh, stuff onto, onto paper, uh, and a terminal was just uh, an innovation that we had, as far as I know. And again, I'm not a historian of computers, so I don't know. But, you know, my recollection was just like, you know, then we went to, you know, terminals as being better than paper, because now you're not wasting this paper uh, to see the output of your computer, and it can go much faster because, you know, you don't have to physically print things and so on. And even so, you know, a lot of computing grew up around that idea. And so even today we have terminals. And so what this was basically about was I am working on a course that's coming out. It's called Star Code Galaxy. And one of the first things you do is you start in text mode because part of the idea of the course is you should kind of follow the steps of how people learn to program originally because uh, a lot of the very best programmers you know, went through a certain path and it tries to kind of mimic that path, right? Uh, and so one of the things I noticed is that actually trying to output things to the terminal, which I don't normally do, I don't normally use terminals very much at all myself, uh, outputting things to the terminal is very slow. Very, very, very slow. Uh, and just to give you an idea of how slow it is, I'll show you some demos today uh, on the actual Windows terminal. This is actually the 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 best case, this is the uh, Windows terminal that you have to download from the Windows Store, uh, which is actually faster than the one that comes with Windows uh, normally. I, I don't really know why, maybe for backwards compatibility, they don't want to like force people to use this one. I, I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, I noticed it was very, very slow compared to what it should be. And so I posted a bug report and the, the, the excuse factory kind of rolled from there, right? And 
so what I wanted to do was show that with not very much time and not very much code, uh, I wrote this in just a couple of days, what I'm going to show you, and the code is very small. It's 3,000 lines of code, uh, and most of that code is not even relevant to the problem. It's just things like wrangling direct write or whatever. With not very much code, you can take pretty much any slow terminal rendering system and turn it into a very fast terminal rendering system. And I think that was a lot of the confusion regarding things is I think people think that somehow speed only comes from like redoing everything. And it's true that the very fastest thing, uh, you probably have to do that. But just using some, you know, just some sensible code uh, and caching, you can turn a slow terminal renderer into a fast terminal renderer. It's quite easy. And so that's what I wanted to demonstrate and kind of show the results of today. Um, again, nothing here is even worth demoing, in my opinion. This is all stuff that in general should just be obvious and simple knowledge. I don't, there's nothing new that you're going to see today. It's all old hat. Um, any renderer person, like a game engine rendering person who came and looked at this would probably not even think it's good, right? They'd probably just be like, everything I'm showing is just kind of garbage anyway, and they could do a much better job. And that's true, right? So I just want to emphasize that before we start. All right, so that's the preamble. I don't want to belabor it too much. That's just where we're at. Um, so let's take a look at, for example, what I'm talking about when I say that the performance isn't very good. Uh, in in like current terminals. So what I'm going to do here is I wrote a program called Splat, um, and all Splat does is it just feeds stuff to standard out as fast as possible. So you can give it uh, a file, uh, and you can you know you can say just dump this to standard out, and then you can test how long your terminal takes to process that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to dump a one gigabyte file of text. Uh, out to Windows Terminal, right? Um, so this is what that looks like. And uh, one of the things about this that's kind of surprising is a gigabyte of data is almost no data. Those of you who work with data for a living know that a gigabyte of data is laughably small um, and nobody would care about it, right? Computers deal with that all the time. They have more core memory than that routinely. A 16 gigabyte uh, core memory computer today is, is Duragur. No one would think that was weird. Um, and yet a single gigabyte of data, uh, this is what it looks like. And it takes so long to wait for this that I'm just going to do the terminal demo while we wait for it to uh, finish. So I'm going to kind of put that over here. Uh, and then we'll just look at RefTerm, uh, which is the terminal uh, emulator that uh, that I made over here. It's not really a terminal. It's just a reference rasterizer. Um, so first of all, this is a regular uh, terminal display. Uh, this is the one that I made, and it's just designed for testing what the efficiency of a terminal should be, so we have some solid numbers. Um, and it supports most things you would expect. So, for example, if you want it to do line wrapping, uh, it will do it. That line wrapping is dynamic, so you can kind of see, uh, right, there's there's no nothing up my sleeve here. It'll just do uh, dynamic wrapping. Um, there's some things it, it doesn't, like like I said, haven't spent really any time on this uh, for the most part. So right now it count it doesn't leave a margin, right? So the last character it puts there, it should probably wrap one character early because, you know, you want to be able to see the whole character. There's a bunch of things like that. This code is GPL v2 and on GitHub. So if anyone wants to turn this into something real, they're welcome to do so and fix some of these little things. And I'll point out what they are as we go. But for the most part, it does everything you would expect. Right, like it's not, it, and it can do like animation, like blinking characters, which I, I don't even think Windows Terminal handles, but that's beside the point. Um, and it also, you know, just has basic stuff. So, for example, I can change the font size if that font was too big. You can change the font size dynamically. Uh, you can change what font you're using dynamically. So, like, if I want to, I can change to a different font. Um, so, there's nothing like hard coded or weird up my sleeve here. I'm not playing any games or tricks. This is designed to test the full pipeline of a terminal. And furthermore, I I wanted to try and handle everything so I could prove that, uh, you know, this wasn't fast because it wasn't handling a lot of special cases. That was an excuse I heard a lot. Uh, Windows Terminal doesn't really even support Arabic correctly. Um, and so I, I put in enough to make sure that if someone wanted to support Arabic correctly and stuff like that, it could, which Windows Terminal doesn't even do. Uh, so for example, uh, if I do... Um, 
I don't even remember what this this is called. Yeah, there you go. Um, if you dump Arabic to, to it, it will actually do it in correct right to left order, and it will do the correct glyph combinations. You can see here. Um, and, and this works uh, with most Arabic. I, I really want someone who knows Arabic well to help me with this. And some people on Twitter were nice enough to, to give me these samples and, and we'll check it out. But basically what you can see here is not only does it support Arabic properly, but it actually supports it even when the size of the Arabic would not be evenly monospaced. So this actually just allows these characters to be however big the glyph wanted it to be. So if your Arabic fallback is essentially a proportional font, it still just works with this renderer. In, in fact, proportional fonts just work with this renderer. They just they'll just do the proportional part that you ask them to do, and then it'll render like on the next cell, right? So Unicode combining cares, we handle uh, right to left, it handles, it does all that stuff. Uh, you know, you can, you can uh, do whatever you want. You can see it, it wraps them uh, just like everything else. So all of that stuff uh, is, is what you would expect. And you can see too up at the top that the frame rate up here, uh, just this is measuring the actual frames per second that the terminal is getting. VSync is turned off, so it's allowed to update as fast as uh, it can. And what you can see here is that the frame rate is literally running at like 7,000 frames a second, right? Um, this is kind of what I was trying to explain to people, and I just wanted to demonstrate that I'm not making these numbers up. When I said that these things should run at thousands of frames a second, I'm not joking. Like, thousands of frames a second is how fast a terminal display runs nowadays. If your terminal isn't running at thousands of frames per second, then something's probably wrong. Now, that's not to say that the terminal should always run at thousands of frames a second. As you'll see, uh, this terminal I itself won't run at thousands of frames a second when it detects that there's very large amounts of input coming over the pipe what it will do instead is it will just go ahead and focus all of its effort right on trying to process that input so the frame rate will drop down to like 30 frames a second while it's processing all that input and then as soon as it's done uh it will pop back now that brings up another point here which is just that the only reason that happens is I wanted, again, I wanted to do like the worst case scenario effectively. So this isn't multi-threaded. <laughs> none, none of the performance that you're seeing here comes from actually using the computer. The 7,000 frames a second is the single thread performance of a terminal renderer. Because again, terminals just don't require that. Um, so we finally finished... Uh, here's here's uh, how long it takes Windows Terminal to output uh, a one gigabyte file. It's 330 seconds, right? So basically, you know, you would expect, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what else to say. 330 seconds, you can see the gigabytes per second of throughput that you're getting here. And I don't know, uh, we should probably run my memory bandwidth testing uh, I, I've never run it on the streaming machine. I should I should probably, well, maybe I have, but I've forgotten what it was. We should probably run um, the memory bandwidth tester on the machine because, you know, I don't know what it is, but it's probably at least 10 gigabytes a second. Uh, it might be as high as 20. I don't remember what this machine has. Um, but you can see here that if you assume that, if you assume that this machine is capable of 10 gigabytes a second, at least, of memory bandwidth, it's got a read and write data, so you figure you're going to get half of that even at peak, so, you know, maybe five gigabytes a second. This isn't even an order of magnitude away from that. It's three orders of magnitude away from that, right? And an order of magnitude away from it might make some sense, because, again, I don't expect people making a terminal program to necessarily spend all their time hyper-optimizing it. That would be nice if they did, especially from a company like Microsoft that has literally billions of dollars and, you know, uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of employees. It would be nice if someone spent some time actually getting the throughput of their terminal up. But, you know, e like I said, the main thing to point out here is that even without really doing any work, like even just the minimum effort, a couple days of work, you can get terminals that have all of the support that you wanted, the rendering side, like all of the support you need for all the stuff you want. Um, and you don't have to be uh, it, it, this this slow, right? So let's take a look at what happens now because uh, there's a separate 
source of slowness, and I want to show you uh, this sort of separate part and talk a little bit about why that's there. So let's suppose that now, without doing anything special, um, I try to do this on here. And what you'll see is it's a little bit surprising. So suppose I try to do that same file um, from, from our terminal, right? Um, and one of the things that you can see that's very, very suspicious, because I just told you that what this terminal will do is it will focus on ingressing input when it sees it, and it won't spend time rendering, right? But you'll notice this is very suspicious here, right? That is not a good number, because that's very close to the same number that we were getting when we weren't doing any of this, right? So when we, it's very close to the frames per second, that the terminal was getting when we were not streaming any data to it. And so you can see here that we get about 10x faster, right? Um, you know, they were 330, we're 39, we're about 10 times faster, which is great. And you might be like, woohoo, it's 10 times faster. But I mean, like I kind of just said, we know that we have two orders of magnitude left to get here. And so the question is like, okay, what's going on? Now, I should mention as the icing on this particular cake of just how ridiculous some of this excuse making gets, I didn't optimize any of this code. I have never taken a performance measurement of this code of any kind. I've never run a profiler on it. I've never optimized any code path I, I, it, at all. So this was literally just the terminal I typed in, compiled in release mode, is all it is. So you might say, well, okay, since yeah, Casey didn't optimize any of the code, maybe that's as fast as it, as it runs, right? But as we know, because some folks um, on the Molly Rocket Discord uh, who were looking at this problem after I sort of posted how slow, you know, uh, the terminal was, they were started looking into it and they found some things. I happen to know going into this uh, example project that Windows console subsystem is really bad. So, you know, Windows kernel is actually pretty good, in my opinion. I I'm not an expert on kernels, so I couldn't say for sure how good it is in some absolute sense. But Windows kernel, you don't normally expect the kernel part to have really slow performance. But in the case of Con.io, so when you're actually sending like standard in back and forth, Windows kernel is actually terrible. And the reason for this is rather than just do direct piping through the terminal like it would if you just use a regular pipe, you go through this subsystem that is not written by the kernel team that does a bunch of stuff to maintain like the layout of the screen so that people can call functions to read back from the console and stuff like this. Now, none of those functions are difficult, and it shouldn't really be that slow to do that, probably. It w it's a little slower, right? Just sending data over a pipe is obviously much faster than actually have to look at the data for things like uh, VT codes or whatever, right? And you've got an extra write in the mix because you've got a write to the that terminal buffer. So, you know, it is more expensive, but it's not that much more expensive. It's not 100x more expensive or potentially 1,000x more expensive, depending on what we're looking at here. So that subsystem is actually the bottleneck now if I do this splat. So the reason we get 40 seconds is not actually because my code is slow. And my code is slow, but it's just not slow enough to be as slow as Windows Console subsystem. So what I wanted to do was also benchmark that. So how fast should naive, unoptimized code, which is what this terminal is, how fast should that still, you know, how, how fast should we still expect it to take uh, an input ingress, right? And the answer there is, or I shouldn't say the answer, but the, the trick to that is bypassing the terminal. So here's how I did that. Um, what I did is I introduced this concept called fast pipes. And what fast pipes are is just a way of bypassing Windows console layer uh, because the Windows console layer is really bad. 
So the way that they work is uh, I made this H file. It's called fastpipe.h. And if you include it, normally it, it won't do anything. So you can see here it just returns zero as a macro. So it doesn't do anything if you include it on like Linux, for example, because I don't know if Linux has this problem. I doubt it does. So if you include this on Linux, it doesn't do anything. If you include it on Windows, however, what it will do uh, is it will look for a secret back channel pipe. And this pipe is just called fast pipe with the process ID of the current process stuck in there, right? And what it will do is if it finds that pipe, it will redirect standard in and standard out to go across that named pipe bypassing the Windows ConIO stuff. So it'll still go through the kernel, so we can test how fast Windows kernel actually is at transferring this data, um, and we can get a realistic estimate of what it takes to round trip everything, but we can bypass the ConIO stuff so we can see just how bad it actually is. So what you can do in this uh, ref term, you can, you can always type status, by the way, and it shows you like what's going on. Um, if you go ahead and type fast pipe, then it'll turn on, it'll, it'll create that pipe before it launches uh, the process. So it'll launch the process suspended, create the fast pipe with that name. And that splat program that I made, the whole reason I'm using that program rather than type or cat or something is because it has fa that fast pipe header file. So now, if we, because if type and cat wouldn't get any faster because they don't have that fast pipe header file, splat does. So splat, you would assume would probably be roughly the same speed as something like cat or type. Uh, if you don't turn fast pipes on, but if you turn fast pipes on, now it can be drastically faster because it can bypass Windows terminal. So it took three something second, three hundred something seconds, uh, three thirty, I think. It took about forty seconds. Uh, with the fast pipes off in our terminal. Um, so now let's go ahead, oops, and uh, and do uh, gig.txt with fast pipes on. Uh, this is what that looks like. And you can see that that drops it by another order of magnitude. So by bypassing the Windows con IO stuff, which is an epic disaster, uh, it gets 10x faster. So that's a huge performance penalty to go through that layer. Uh, and that just slows all terminals down, even ones that didn't, that weren't slow for other reasons. Um, that's the case. Now, there's even worse scenarios than this. That is with VT parsing turned off. Not in my terminal. My terminal's doing the VT parsing. Um, that's with VT parsing turned off in Windows ConIO. If you turn VT parsing on, it probably gets even worse. I haven't done that test, but I suspect that if it has to actually do VT parsing, which you have to call set console to do, then you're in even more trouble. So best case scenario, it's 10x slower. That's when there's no like color information getting sent down or cursor positioning. All of that's turned off uh, in splat. I should probably make a thing that turns it on so we can see how bad it is, but either way. Um, so that's pretty much it. I mean, kind of like I said, there's not much to say here. This is just kind of obvious stuff. Uh, I just felt like it kind of had to be done at least once because the excuse making is so absurd these days that I felt like it would be nice to take something that people were saying was impossible and it's just like there's no way you could write maintainable code that does this uh, it, or it would be this big research project. It was called a PhD project by one of the Microsoft developers to do this. Uh, what is literally being done on the screen right now that took me a, a couple days. Um, so I just wanted to show that all of that's nonsense. And in case you're wondering about how complex the code is, let me show you basically the entirety of the code that you actually need to support this rendering. This is it. Um, it's just called glyph table. Um, it, the file's called glyph cache, and it's, it's just a glyph table, right? Um, it's, it's basically these functions that you see here, right? It's uh, initialize direct lift table, uh, get footprint and place in memory, unpack, find, update, and then a stats thing if you want to know how it did, right? And the code, like, this is the code. That, that's, that's it. That's the entirety of the code. All it is is a least recently used cache that takes a strong hash value, basically. In this case, I use Pelican hash modified pelican hash basically but you can feed it whatever hash you want you can do whatever you want all it does is say okay um 
tell me how many glyphs you want to map directly, which is you know, like ASCII, right? You probably want to map those directly because there's a small number of them and they're the most heavily used thing in terminal because most code is written in ASCII. So it directly maps those so that when you get an ASCII character, you can actually just go directly to a cache slot. Uh, and then it just has 128-bit hash lookup, least recently used, for everything else. So if you get a big run of Arabic character combination stuff that's like 20 characters long, you just hash that 20 characters, you send it to this thing, it says, oh, yeah, we've produced that glyph already, here it is, or no, we haven't, um, you know, go get it. And it supports, uh, it, it uses kind of a, a rolling hash to allow you to, to have any of those glyphs take as many tiles as you want. So that's how I do like the long, if, if an Arabic thing wants to be very long, which sometimes they do, or like an emoji that takes up two squares, that's how that works, right? Um, and that's it. That's all it is. It's just that. And then you put the glyphs in a texture. That, that's, that's the code, right? Uh, there's nothing else there. Um, I, I don't know what else to say. Uh, there's a bunch more code. The reason, I mean, so it would be like a couple hundred lines of code if you just want to talk about the logic of how you render something like this. That's it. It's a couple hundred lines of code that anyone could do. Here's the shader. Um, it's, it's nothing. And by the way, this shader also runs in two formats. This will run as a vertex p uh, pixel shader, vertex and pixel shader, if you want, or it'll run as a compute shader in the same shader. So it's not even like, uh, this is both shaders together because they're so simple. You don't even have to pick. You can just say, hey, well, however you want to do it, right? Here's the entirety of the code. It doesn't do anything. It just looks up the screen position uh, and composites the glyph, right? Now, one change I'll probably make to this, uh, because I wanted to do some stuff, I wanted to show that you could do even things that, that don't currently really work. I mean, it already does things that don't work in Windows Terminal, but it could do even more things that don't work in Windows Terminal. Um, and specifically, what I want to do is, I, I think, because this runs so fast, I mean, it's like 8,000 frames a second or whatever, 7,000 frames a second. I think a little more of that time, should we should probably slow this down by adding a second texture fetch. And the reason for that is then you could do arbitrarily oversized glyphs. So if you want to do like italics that lean into the next cell, a second texture fetch here would just do that, right? And since it runs so fast, I think it, you might as well because it probably isn't even really going to slow it down that much. And you might as well spend a little bit more of that fray rate to get an extra feature for free, which you just can, right? Um, so it's all very, very simple. There's... Uh, also in here, just so for people who want to look at the code base, this is obviously, uh, I should mention, um, this is all on GitHub as ref term under C Muratory. So you can just go look at the code. It's GPLv2. Um, there's also, I just, in here because I had to do it, there's example code for all the other stuff, but it's just not good code, right? Uh, so there's example code for like, that's you know, streaming for the fast for receiving fast pipes for generating glyphs with direct write, um, and so on. And again, all of this stuff. So when I did this, I accepted as constraints all of the constraints that I felt like the visual, uh, uh, not the visual, the Windows Terminal team had, which is I, I have to use direct write. Like I can't go write my own glyph renderer that would actually be fast. Direct write is horribly slow. It's one of the, I, I I can't even imagine why it's so slow. Uh, I, I don't know. It, it's incredibly slow. Um, so I accept that. I'm like, okay, the glyph generator, we have to assume, is so slow that it almost, you'd never get above 30 frames a second, um, you, maybe not even that, if you were actually going to use it to generate all the glyphs on the screen every frame. So I just took that as given. Um, and, uh, and the same is true for figuring out what's Unicode and what's not. I used Uniscribe. I used the thing that's in Windows, which is terrible. Uh, it's horrible, right? Uh, if I actually wrote that myself, it would take longer, um, but it would actually be fast. It's horribly slow right now. Uh, so I accepted all those things as constraints on the design of this system. But the truth is, again, you don't have to write everything to be fast. You just insert caching 
or you do a few things to make sure that the bad parts of the code, if they are things you can't change, you just isolate them and cache them and off you go, right? Some problems you can't do that with and that would be a harder problem, but that's why I say terminal rendering is so simple because it's just an embarrassingly simple problem, right? You don't have to rewrite the world to make a fast terminal. You just cache the things that are slow and you're done, right? Um, so anyway, uh, that's, that's basically it. Uh, I don't know that there's really much else to say. There are some things that I probably would like to fix, um, just for reference purposes. They have nothing to do with the renderer. This completely validated the renderer for me. Like it obviously proves everything that I think I wanted to prove without exception. I, I don't think there's any excuse you can possibly make now, um, as for why things are slow. So, if you've got a new one, I'm happy to hear it, but I can't think of any excuse that people could have because it's like, here's the code, and that's how fast it runs. Just like I said, it would. But um, I don't know anything about direct write. So in order to do this project, I had to learn direct write because I had no idea how that worked. It's terrible, by the way. It's, it's, it's one of the worst APIs. It's not as bad as event tracing for Windows, but it's absolutely horrible, right? Direct write is fantastically terrible. Um, I had to learn it, and I don't really know how it works. The documentation's bad. The API is bad. I don't really know how it works. So one of the things that I can't figure out how to get it to do, um, and I'll show you an example here. So like, let's say, uh, right? One of the things I don't know how to get it to do is shrink. So what is happening here is called font substitution, I believe. So when you are printing out something, if the font doesn't have the thing that you're printing, it will substitute a different font in place of the one that you're using so that it can get glyphs that it doesn't have. And one of the problems that seems to happen uh, with direct write that I don't know how to fix, I've come up with ideas for fixing it on my own, but I'm not sure how you fix them in, but I'm not sure you make direct write do the right thing, is I don't know how to tell it, look, I, I need you to shrink or pick a font where this thing is going to fit inside the cell. Because, again, like I said, I wanted to add oversized glyph rendering, so if I added that, it wouldn't clip these. You'd see them, but they'd still be wrong. Like, especially something like this that looks like there's quite a bit down there, it would kind of obscure, like, the line below it. And so what I really want Direct Write to do is pick a font when it does the fallback, pick a size that's small enough that it still fits in the square. And GDI, I had a GDI path as well. Uh, you can't enable it right now because I don't know how to get GDI to actually do alpha. So with colored glyphs, it's, it doesn't really work. Um, I could you know, put the alpha in myself, but the alpha wouldn't be correct because for colored glyphs, it, it doesn't matter. It's a long story. But anyway, GDI picked correctly. So when you run this through GDI, you actually get fonts that shrink down properly, but DirectWrite doesn't do it. So one of the things I'd like to fix is Find out if somebody knows how to get direct write to stop doing that, A. But B, if direct write just won't do that, then one of the things I was thinking is, well, I could just make my own shader that instead of updating these resources by copying them, we could shrink them ourselves. Because when the glyph generator generates them, it knows how big they are, so we could like resample them downward. Ideally, you wouldn't do that because the whole point of rasterizing glyphs on the fly is so that they're not bitmapped, so they can be like infinitely precise for whatever the size is. So I'd really prefer it if there was some way to tell Direct Write not to do this. The other thing I was thinking is maybe we just implement font fallback ourselves. Again, free to do because the glyph generator is cached. So even if that takes a little while, it's not going to affect the performance. So that's another option. But I would love to hear suggestions from anyone who knows how to get Direct Write to stop doing that because that'd be the best case. Um, but I think there are other cases we could use to fix that. Uh, but that was ridiculous. I don't know why it does that. Um, so it would be nice to to, to fix that. Um, the other thing is right now, so I'm trying to think there's, there's one or two other things that, there, oh, right now, um, so the code path, I, I use Uniscribe. Like I said, I just kind of accepted the constraints that you have to call things in Windows because this is, I wanted to, Pretend you're in the footsteps, uh, the, you're you're in the like shoes of the Windows terminal team, and you have to call these Windows things that are very bad. Um, I use Uniscribe, and Uniscribe also is terrible. And I don't think I really understand that API very well at all. It's a better API than DirectWrite, but it's also ho horrible. 
Um, so if you look at what happens here, this is actually subtly wrong. The reason it's subtly wrong is because Uniscribe puts the space character into the same batch as the glyph. And so the space doesn't really show up in here because it goes to the glyph generator as a space and then the space gets truncated. So I should probably fix that by just hacking the Uniscribe path. But the Uniscribe path is also horribly slow. So anytime you're dumping a lot of Unicode to things, things slow down slightly. And that would be nice to fix. So another thing that I think might be nice is to just put in some UTF-8 uh, Unicode parsing. Because all you really need is something that knows the boundaries of what... Ha you just need something that tries to figure out what the boundaries are of things that you need to pass to the glyph generator as a chunk. That's all you need to do. It's, just, it's not even UTF-8 parsing, really. It's just chunking. So having a nice community verified, like people who speak lots of different languages could try it and make sure that it actually worked on their languages. Because that's the hard part is knowing whether, you know, it's trivial for ASCII. You don't have to do anything. It's just every character, right? Um, and it's maybe slightly more difficult, but still pretty trivial to do like this kind of text where all, all you just have accents. Um, but if you want text like this, where it's like a complex combining character set, I think that's probably somewhat difficult to do. And so you would want, I mean, difficult, right? It's, it's still a very simple problem. It just takes some elbow grease to know what all the cases are, right? You have to go, you have to actually go look, look up um, and work with some people who, who, you know, are fluent in Arabic writing to find out what that is. So that would be a nice thing to do because Uniscribe, it's, it's not good and it would be nice to just get rid of that and that would also speed things up. Um, so basically, it's those two things. Uh, that's really the and and you you know the the text sizing issue, the direct right just picking bad things is really a bad issue for monospace because you can see here. Uh, let me show you another thing. Um, what is the actual? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember what the. Um, oops. It's like uh, plain text stress UTF. Uh, so splat plain text stress UTF eight. Um, so you can see like this stuff is not correct either, right? Um, what happens is it gets the right characters, but it doesn't know that it doesn't keep them in line with the grid. And this is the same exact problem as the um, as the like emoji being too large. What's happening here is I believe, direct right substituting a font to get these other characters, but that font is like not the right size. So when I ask it how big it is, it reports that it's like bigger than a cell. So I think, oh, this must be something that takes multiple cells, right? But that's not what's actually going on. So it would be nice to fix some of this stuff um, because the render doesn't care. It's just a question of getting the glyph generator to do something, right? And of course, we could fix all this by writing our own glyph generator, but the whole point was to show that you could do it without a glyph generator, with, without your own glyph generator, as long as you're just sensible. Um, I think that's basically it. I'll be happy to take questions now, um, but I'm going to go ahead and, and stop the uh, cycle of the recording for the questions. The only thing I would point out too is again, nothing up my sleeve here. I tried to implement everything I could think of that goes into a terminal to ensure that there were no code path uh, shortcuts that were being taken to get the speed. Um, but again, it's not a real terminal. So you can't, I'm, you know, you can't go use this as your terminal. I apologize. Uh, people could make a terminal out of it if they want to, but you know, it's not, it's just a demonstration of how you do the rendering. Um, but again, I try to support everything. So another thing that's here you'll notice is scroll back works just fine too. So one of the things you might have thought, uh, one of the excuses people might have had was like, oh, it's but it's not doing scroll back buffers. Like, yes, it is. And also the scroll back buffers line wrap. So again, there's no trickery here as far as I know. Um, I tried to do everything that you might want to do um, to make sure that there's no like shortcutting and no weird excuses that people can come up with. Um, also, you know, it works pretty much with, with whatever font size. It's not really like about the size of the font. Obviously it'll get slower, uh, if, if you have more stuff on the screen, cause it has to send down more character cells, uh, for change. This, by the way, 
no optimizations. This sends down the whole screen's worth of cells every frame. So again, you, you wouldn't have to do that, but it does. So it's the worst case, again. Slows down to like 2,000 frames a second with really tiny cells. You know, not a big deal. Uh, and again, you can still run these tests. I believe FastPipe's still on, right? Yeah. Uh, you can still run these tests and see it doesn't matter that the fonts are tiny. Um, it still only takes two seconds. So, like, there's no trickery. It. All I can say is, I, like, there's no excuses for this stuff being slow. It's so simple. Very, very simple. Small amount of code gives you a complete terminal renderer that runs incredibly fast. And I do not know why people a won't accept that fact and b make up weird excuses like somehow if you in included tons of like standard library stuff and had tons of classes in here so instead of just five simple functions that you just call that are very self-explanatory simple and short you add tons of like resizing standard vector all over the place and all this garbage like you look at the windows terminal code base and it's just that garbage for days huge amounts of code people somehow think that's more maintainable how is that more maintainable like it's way more code. The code, you don't know what it does. Like most of the people who are calling those things, standard vector, standard string, they don't know what they do internally. They've never even stepped through them half the time. So, you know, this is something you can actually see the entire code path. You can step through every line. It's trivial. There's almost nothing in it um, for the renderer side. It's, it's just nothing, right? It's like a few lines of code. It's very easy to understand. Um, and the bonus part is, because it doesn't use anything, it's it's no libraries are in there in the render. It's just a bare file. There's no pound includes that it even uses in the in the like in the cache, for example. It's just just straight line written code. It doesn't break, right? Like if somebody changes something in the standard library that gets slower, it doesn't matter, right? Whereas otherwise, you got all these weird performance dependencies. Somebody screws up the behavior of standard vector, and all of a sudden your code is slow, right? And you don't know why. So. Uh, I don't know. It's a very exacerbating situation. I wish I didn't have to keep doing this stuff. I, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why people refuse to see obvious stuff that's like plain to see. It's just, and it just gets really tiring. It's, it's really exhausting to program these days because nobody seems to know anything and they just make excuses all day long instead of just going and looking at what you would actually do, what the code is that's necessary to make something happen. I, 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 I don't know. So uh, in one sense, here, there, that's some proof. Hopefully, I don't know. Uh, in another sense, it's like I give up. You know, it, it was exactly like I said it was. It was trivial code to write. Most of the pain in the butt was working with direct write and direct 2D, which are terrible, um, and Uniscribe, right? And uh, it, it's super simple code that anyone could maintain if they know how to program C. The LRU cache is a little finicky. Like, you know, it's the kind of code that I, if I was going to ship this, I would probably make some unit tests for because it does maintain, like, two linked lists in there, right? The, the internally, like, chaining together. Um, but, I mean, even if you didn't do that, if you replace that with some standard kind of hash table, I think, still think this code would probably run roughly the same speed. You know, so even if you don't want to write a hash table for some reason, although, yeah, I don't know. Th does the standard library even have an LRU hash table? Probably not. So that's it. Uh, that's the end of the video. It was very depressing. Uh, the response to making simple statements about this, and I don't know. It's the kind of thing that just makes you not want to engage with development communities these days because it's just so ridiculous that you have to keep saying this stuff and demonstrating this stuff because everyone should just know this if they're actually working at a job, right? This is stuff you should have learned in your first year <laughs> of working as a programmer professionally, but we were so far away from that. It's just like, you know, I don't know. So anyway, that's it. I'm going to go ahead and stop this so I can post that part to YouTube. Uh, um, and I'm going to go be depressed now in the Q&A. Okay, so sorry, I forgot one thing. Uh, so, uh, like, I went to the Q&A, and people reminded me that, that colored text or text on a colored background that changes every time or whatever was one of the standard excuses. So let me show that as a simple demo as well. Um, so here is Windows Terminal um, running a test 
where uh, you can see that it's like different color text um, that changes over time on various like, you know, there there's like, I don't know if you can see, but this is probably the font looks a little too large. Let me let me see if I can get the whole thing on the screen. Um, sorry, I don't really know how to use Windows Terminal. Uh, so so maybe like if I set it down to to that, it would work. Um, did that change it? It still look you can see that there's a break there. I think that line is still not quite on the screen for whatever reason. Um, did that actually set it? Do I have to hit like OK or something? I don't know. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't really know how to use this thing. I don't think that's doing anything. Is there like a, is it there a thing hidden? Here, let me see. Ah, ha, ha, there it is. All right. That's a great place for that save button. Um, okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and try it now. There we go. So now we can get the whole thing on the screen. So let me do a CLS. Okay. So this is an example of just, it, all this is doing is just splatting VT codes out to the screen. And it changes the text color uh, of, of the text. And it changes the color of the background. Uh, and you can see the like draw speed here. Uh, this this is a measure of how many characters it's able to sync. So this is 163,000 colored glyphs per second, right? Uh, with, the, with the background and the foreground uh, color changing. Um, so, you know, that gives you some background. So 169 uh, is, or 162, something like that, right? Somewhere between 160 and 170 is what that's able to maintain. Uh, in, in Windows Terminal Preview or whatever. This is the latest Windows Terminal I could find uh, on, on the Windows Store. So that's where they're at. Um, here's us running. Uh, so if, if we do a status here, oops. Uh, if we do a status, uh, this is with uh, fast pipes off. So no fast pipe. I'll run the same program. Um, this is how fast it runs. So this is about how fast you would expect Terminal to run, because Terminal still goes through Windows Kernel. If they were rendering properly, this is what it would be. So that gives you a good, so, so that's like 5,300 and whatever that is, right? Um, so it's about, what is that, like 40 times faster? I don't know, something like that. Um, so you may ask, like, why is it so much slower? I, I believe that's because uh, they call direct write for like every glyph in this case. So remember I said direct write's really slow. So, you know, they, they really can't probably get above that speed without fixing how they're doing uh, glyph rendering um, would be my guess. Uh, and this was actually what started the whole thing is, is on their GitHub, they were like, oh, well, we'll separate out the foreground and the background color rendering so that we can pass more things to direct write. And I'm like, that, what? I'm like, don't do that. I'm like, just use a tile renderer. And, and that's when they called that a PhD project. So, you know, that, that's that's where we're at today, right? Professional people getting paid very high salaries to say that on GitHub. So uh, this is is without fast pipes. If we actually turn fast pipes on and then run term bench, you can see the actual speed. So this is how fast it should be running if you got rid of the Windows Kanayo nonsense that's going on in there that you don't need for anything. Um, this is what you'd actually get. So it's 3x faster even than the one that's 40 fat times faster, right? So this is about 100 times faster than Windows Terminal. They were between 160 and 170. We're between 17,200 and 17,300, right? Um, so I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, That, that's where we're at. Again, this is unoptimized code. I, I, I can't stress that enough. Let me just leave you on that final thought. I did not optimize this code. I don't even know what the slow part of my code is. I have never timed it. I have never even run a profiler on this code. So, like, just... Just so we're clear, 
This is the speed you get when you just type in the basic, simplest possible thing that you can think of to cache a glyph. You get this. And of course, you have to bypass the Windows kernel, so I suppose you could count that as an optimization, but that was really just so I could test. So I don't know how you want to classify that. But I didn't time that. I just happened to know that that was a very slow part of the process because other people had already posted that. So that's not necessary. Someone else can tell you that. So it would be interesting to see how fast you could get this to go if you actually optimized your code, right? We could potentially make this much faster. We don't know how fast this could run. So really, let me just end with ref term is like the slowest your terminal should run. It's, it's like the minimum bar. This is not, ref term is not like highly optimized code you should like aspire to made by amazing monk programmers who slaved over every line or something. This is the min, this is the bare minimum. This is just what a basic, sane, simple code base produces is that speed, right? Or the speed I showed before that's a one third this if you don't bypass the kernel, right? Um, which you might not be able to do for other reasons, right? If you're trying to do something where you still want that backwards compat um, and you don't want to implement all of conptty yourself. Uh, so so that, that's it. Um, and and I'm gonna, now I'm going to actually go to Q&A.